Hey everyone, this is Elizabeth from the Community Library, and today I'm going to be talking about um, some different things about DNA testing and how to get in touch with cousins if you after you do any DNA test. Um, so this is part of Family History Month, and um, it's part of a series of videos. So each Monday in October, there's a new video coming out about Family History Month. So this is going to be a really brief overview about some of the different kinds of tests, um, what to consider when you do a DNA test, and also um, some general tips about getting in touch with your DNA matches. So first, um, you have to think about um, the DNA test, the actual test. Um, so first thing you can think about is why do you want to do a DNA test? Um, so similarly to when you're doing family history, like I've talked about before, um, you want to think about the why so that you can focus more on the goals or the outcomes. So are you interested in doing in a DNA test because you want to find relatives? Maybe you're an adoptee and you want to find people you're related to. Or are you more interested in the ethnicity estimates and learning um, about that side more? Um, and it's also good to think about because for the next step, once you decide which test to go with, um, that will kind of lead your decision. So um, there's probably like four main companies that I have here. So like Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Family Tree DNA um, that you can do a DNA test through. Um, so Ancestry is the one that we usually recommend first just because they have the most... Um, people that have done DNA tests on their website. So you'll get the most matches, generally speaking. Sometimes it depends on where your family is from. Um, while 23andMe and the other tests have um, different estimates and also different interfaces, so their websites look different. So it's basically up to you. Um, generally, Ancestry is a good one to go for when you're first starting out. And another thing to consider when you're doing these DNA tests is um, one to wait for sales. So they do sales like kind of throughout the year on DNA testing kits. Um, sometimes during Black Friday, sometimes during different family history related months that um, you can get a discount on a testing kit. And you should generally be able to find one for under a hundred um, for a testing kit. Another thing to think about is that a few of the DNA testing companies or websites will let you upload your DNA data from another site like Ancestry to their website for no cost um, or for like a little cost. So for example, once you do a DNA test on Ancestry and you get your results, you can go into your account and download your um, results or your, it's basically a big file of your DNA results and then you can go to MyHeritage or Family Tree DNA also does this or there's another website called GEDmatch. You'll go there and they have an option to upload your DNA test to their website which will allow you to get matches on their website and also um, sometimes see your ethnicity estimates on their website. So it's just something to think about. You don't have to do multiple. You can just try one and then do these other options to, if you're looking for more matches. Um, so some things to consider as you're doing a DNA test. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is ethnicity estimates. So this is a reason that a lot of people take DNA tests. They want to find out where their family is from. Um, so it's a little more complicated than just taking the DNA test. Um, so your DNA or your genetics can't tell you where your ancestors lived for certain. That's real, not really what they're doing. Instead, your ethnicity is calculated through algorithms of the company by comparing your DNA profile to a reference population to estimate your ethnic makeup. So they're basically estimating, um, which means that as they get more um, people in their reference population, or they change their algorithms, your estimate may change over time. So it's not a concrete thing. Um, another thing to think about is your privacy in data. Um, so you might have heard about 
a few years ago, um, the Golden State Killer in California was caught. He was a serial killer using forensic genealogy. So a genealogist um, used GEDmatch specifically to um, put a DNA sample into the um, website and they ended up finding a match which led them back to the person who was the Golden State Killer. So forensic genealogy is becoming much more common and um, some different websites have different policies about letting law enforcement use their website and um, who is able to access your information. So it's worth reading the privacy policies and doing some research before you choose which DNA test to use. Um, and it's really just about what you're comfortable with and just so you're aware going into it um, what your data is going to be used for. Another thing too is that um, a lot of people will just want to take a DNA test and then be done with it, just get their estimates and see some matches and that's it. Um, but generally DNA testing doesn't stand alone if you're more interested in your family history. So just doing the DNA test won't tell you much if you don't know um, some general information about your family tree. So it's best to use alongside um, traditional family history research, like doing your family tree, researching into your family's background, stuff like that. And actually, once you get far enough into your family tree where you're into your great-grandparents or second great-grandparents, you can actually start verifying your test results or matches against your own research. So, for example, I know that I have a lot of family that immigrated to the U.S. from Eastern Europe. So when I start seeing in my ethnicity estimates that I'm like 25% Eastern European, it makes sense and it matches up with what my own research has said. So next, once you've done your DNA test, you will start getting some matches. Um, so I just wanted to go over a few little things that you might notice as you're looking at your DNA matches. So the first thing is that um, many of these companies can't really determine what your relationship is to your match. So you'll see a lot of um, just first cousin, second cousin, and third cousin, and so on. Um, but to determine your actual match or your actual relationship, um, you'll have to do some research. So generally in the match, it'll give you um, the percentage of DNA you share and also the um, shared centimorgans um, that you share with your match. So here on this chart over here, you can kind of use these to determine which um, relationship you have. So if you have 53.13 centimorgans, you might be third cousins under your second great grandparent. Um, and like I said, so you can determine it through your percentage or if you can identify which um, grandparent you share in common, that will help you also um, determine your relationship. So if you are looking at your shared matches and you see someone you recognize, um, that will help you figure out what your relationship is. Other times, though, there um, might be times where you just can't figure it out on your own. Um, maybe it's a close match that you don't recognize any names or you just can't figure out how you're related. Um, in this case, it's sometimes good to reach out to the person that did the test and see what they think or what they might know about your relationship. So in this case, um, as you're trying to get in touch with your cousins or your DNA matches, there's a few things you want to consider. So the first thing is how to get in touch. So most DNA testing websites will have a messaging system that you can use. Um, sometimes you have to choose to get notifications via email. So if you know you're not going to check your like ancestry account that often, you can have it set up so that when you get a message, it'll send it to your email. Um, some people don't, don't do that. Um, and know that some people don't check their messages or they just do the test, look at the website once, and then never log back in again. Um, so after you message them, just know that it might be a while before you hear back, if you ever hear back. Um, 
And when you're messaging, you want to keep it simple. You don't really want to overwhelm them and give them their whole life story first time contacting them. Um, so just include the information that that's necessary. So introduce yourself, um, let them know how you think you're related. Maybe you see a name you recognize or something in their tree if they have a family tree and why you want to reach out. So maybe you're just want to verify their relationship. Maybe you think um, it'll break down a brick wall in your family tree. Um, just give them a basic overview so that once they kind of know why you're contacting them and it's easy for them to respond. So once you um, connect and start talking back and forth, you can share more about your life. And this does happen quite often. If you don't hear back from someone, it can be really frustrating, um, but it does happen. So if you contact someone, say two or three times, and they don't respond, um, it might be time to stop messaging. You don't really want to bombard someone with messages, especially if it's a stranger or someone you're just trying to meet. Um, some people manage their relatives' accounts, so you're not the per you're not really contacting the person you actually want to talk to, or they're just thinking about how they want to respond. Um, and you don't want to burn any bridges. So you just want to be patient and be willing to share when they do reach out. And so that's all I had for today. Um, I hope that helped with any simple questions you have about DNA testing. Um, and tune in next week for um, a video about some local southeastern and greater Wisconsin resources for genealogy. Thanks.